Well, it's a huge uh, honour and probably a mixed blessing to be sharing a stage with Terry Waite. His, uh, his writing, of course, uh, informs much of what we do, but of course his experience in Beirut casts a long, there I say, six foot seven shadow over our work. Now, Richard has set out the, uh, the needs that we encounter, the, the needs that we come across, the killing, the injustices, the shattered lives and ruined economies. But we didn't uh, bring you all here to pile the, the gloom and sorrow of the world on your shoulders. Uh, we're here to talk a bit about what Concordis does to change things. I suppose my role here is to answer the question for you, does what we do actually work? You know, does, it, does our work really make a difference in the world? As Richard has said, conflict is rarely about one issue. And the conflict lines are rarely straightforward. For example, uh, as, we all, as we all know, a, a domestic row about the washing up is rarely just about the washing up. You need to draw no conclusions about Richard and my newly married state from that. <laughs> but as we, we find in Mali, from our analysis in Mali, where we're looking to develop a, a new program in partnership with Tear Fund. That there, of course, we all know that there was a, a significant Islamist uprising in the north of Mali. But many of the Tuareg who engaged in that uprising were not Islamist. Much of their motivation was that they were concerned for greater political autonomy from Bamako. And yet it would be a further mistake to believe that actually this was all about an independence movement, the creation of a, a, a Tuareg state, uh, the Aswad uh, province. Because many of those in the affected region in, in the north of Mali were Sonke, or their pearl. They, they have no particular interest in a Tuareg state. And then as you go into the situation more closely, you can see that during the conflict, whilst uh, the rule of law was really not in place, during all of the, the turmoil of the conflict, you have people brutalised by that conflict. And you see that this, this creates the conditions for a myriad of other smaller conflicts between communities, even between families. And in turn, each of those conflicts cause another set of grievances, another set of problems. And so what might start, as you, you look very simplistically at a situation, at an analysis of a conflict, you might think, oh, well, this is uh, an independence movement, or this is a movement to overthrow a government. But actually, uh, that conflict can then give birth to a thousand other smaller conflicts that all have to do, they're like neighborhood disputes that have to do with land and fences and livestock. Conflicts are multifaceted and they exist on many different levels. It's complicated, as they say. Which is why, whilst we try to be as well informed as we can possibly be, it's really important to us that we retain the humility not to believe that we have the solutions to the world's problems. And that's why we use local staff where possible. It might not have escaped your notice that we're all, uh, all a bit white and male at the front here. But actually that's because the staff that are doing most of our work, the men and women in our teams that are doing most of the work, that, well, they're, they're there, they're busy, they're, they're doing the work on the ground. Because they are the ones who have that best grasp of the culture, of the history, of the languages that are needed. They realise that, for example, the conflict in Côte d'Ivoire did, did not start with the election in 2010. There are deep roots to that conflict. And it's important that we explore the roots of that conflict, as Terry has just said and made very, very clear. 
And also that's why we need to work at several different levels at once. So we work at a, at a community level where the conflict is felt most acutely. We work to resolve local grievances right at the source, preventing, seeking to prevent that escalation into further violence. So we work at the community level. We work between the community and community leaders, civil society leaders, and the regional authorities, the regional government, the regional power brokers. We work to try to help those who govern actually have to take that governance position responsibly and govern for the benefit of the people and those who are governed to hold those who govern to account. Facilitating a dialogue between the people and the local government. So we work at community level. We work at that middle level. And then at a higher level, we speak with those who have the power to make a difference. Whether that's the, the national government, the national development agencies, or folks in the international community. And we try to advocate the recommendations that come out of our dialogue process to those with that power. And I have to say, this approach of prevention through dialogue and resolution of conflict and transformation of conflict is something that is really exciting to us. Yes, we seek to prevent conflict. We seek to prevent that crisis of conflict, that terrible moment that we've all seen on television where Terry was taken into a, a van in Beirut. We seek to prevent those crises. But actually much of what we do is to examine the root causes of that conflict, to work for long-term peace, but also for economic and social development, human flourishing. So in uh, Mauritania, <clears throat> in Mauritania, you may or may not know, uh, a large group of people in Mauritania, mostly Pula, uh, were expelled uh, from the country in 1998. Uh, and they were expelled, and their land, their houses, were given to people mostly from a, a Haratine group, many of whom were former slaves, some of whom, and I will choose my words carefully, live in conditions that some people might construe to be a bit like slavery. Pause. When the refugees returned, seven, eight years ago, of course, they found their land, uh, their homes, occupied uh, by others. And so they moved in al alongside. And the conflict in the south of Mauritania is between these two groups, those former slaves and those returning refugees, both very disenfranchised, very disempowered, both very poor. About half a million people live in conditions of what might be construed absolute poverty below a dollar twenty-five a day. And they live side by side and yet hostile to one another. And as we did our analysis, we found many examples where people, well-meaning people, even, yeah, well-meaning people, let's leave it at that, uh, gave development assistance without really doing an analysis of what was going on there. So they gave development assistance to one community to the exclusion of the other community. So they might say, well, you know, clearly there's a need for uh, a mill to help grind the grain, to save that back-breaking work of grinding the grain. They give a mill to one community. Or they'll, they'll, they'll provide a well for one community, put this well in. Meanwhile, the other community is still backbreakingly grinding their grain. They're still walking for miles to drink unsafe water from the river. Well, wouldn't you know it, those mills happen to be broken now. Many of those wells have 
somehow a dead goat is in the bottom and they're poisoned. That development assistance was not provided in a conflict-sensitive way. And when cows from one community start eating the crops from the other, it just gets very, very difficult and extremely dangerous. So in that situation, we found respected people in the community. Some of them are teachers, civil society leaders, religious leaders. And we trained them. We've trained in Mauritania. We've trained 120. Another, Mauritania, another 120 in Côte d'Ivoire. Trained them to be community mediators. And we sent them out two by two into the communities. And so if there's a conflict between Haritin and Pearl, we'll have one Haritin and one Pular, and they'll work together. That helps with the languages, because often people don't speak one another's languages, but also helps with that real perception of impartiality in, the, in all our negotiations. And they work with those communities and try and work out, really get to the root of the conflict. It's back to getting to the root of the conflict. Not what people say they're arguing about, but what's at the heart of this. And in most cases, even after a year, we're starting to see results. We're st folks are starting to see that actually if they work alongside each other, they can get much better development assistance, more development assistance than if they work against each other. They've realized that they can share a well or a school or an irrigation system. Actually, that means there's more, if there's an irrigation system, there's more land to go around. It, they realize it's in people's mutual benefit to work together rather than working against each other, especially if we then advocate on their behalf, advocate their recommendations with those with the power to make a difference to deliver that assistance. But that's all very well. You can say, well, that's just vested interest. But what we've also found, and this is exciting, is that gradually people's behavior towards the other starts to change. People have started to go to one another's mosques People have started to go to one another's weddings, which are big community events. And as they pray together, as they do community together, they have started feeling able to trade with one another. If you've got two communities living side by side, who are not trading with one another. That is, gives a severe problem for the market. There's a real limit to the market that is available for your produce. In this august legal establishment, I feel I ought to provide you with hard facts. So forgive me if we move uh, from uh, Mauritania back to, to South Sudan, where we've been working longer and there are, there's more going on. The release of the children shown in, in, in that video, in the, Dink, in the Nok Dinka and the Miseria. After that release happened, they started to trade petrol and diesel with one another. As a result of that, the price of diesel halved. The price of uh, petrol dropped from 750 South Sudanese pounds to 300 South Sudanese pounds. Opening up new markets, providing cheaper fuel, and therefore more economic access to those markets. Well, these are essential if communities are to reduce their dependence on aid, and if they, even the communities, but even the whole country, is to become more economically viable. And, you know, once we've established these peace dividends, whether it's development assistance, livelihoods, access to markets, then we can start talking. Only then can we start talking. 
about the real drivers of the conflict, which might be conflict over land or forced labor. This is dialogue for preventing conflict. It's dialogue for resolving conflict. And it's dialogue to transform the situations that cause conflict. That is the heart of our mission. It can be really tough, but it does work. The paramount chief of the Miseria said, it was the work of Concordis that compelled me to return these children. It was the work of Concordis that compelled me to return these children. And why? Well, it's exactly as Terry has just been saying to us. It's through a process of face-to-face -face meetings. It's through building relationships of trust. And it's getting to the root of the issue. I have to say, we find it quite difficult to explain what we do. A lot of it's very sensitive. And if we're not careful, we get all bogged down in lots of detail about this group and that group and the other group. One of the things we've tried to do is to, to, to boil this down into a, a kind of an illustration that, that sort of works. But we, it's, I have to say, it's a kind of a work in progress. So can you, this is all part of our kind of conversation today, can you have a look at this and see if this makes clear what we do? People in conflict have a lot to say. Often, no one is listening. We listen. We bring people together to talk. In focused dialogue, they are able to find common ground. They agree on what can be done to help resolve their conflict and build a better future together. Concordas International, building relationships for sustainable peace.